Okay, so the most important thing I can tell you is if you claim to be a real estate professional, you better be documenting the heck out of what you do. Keep it on a calendar. I, I would have a full on time log that said I started something at this time and ended at that time. Describe what you were doing and how long it took you to do it in minutia and be able to support that with receipts. If you install the toilet seat, have a receipt for a toilet seat. If you put on a doorknob, have a receipt for a doorknob. But here's where most people burn down. Not all activities count as material participation for this 750 hours test, for the 100 hours test, for any of the tests that I was describing. This is how this stuff is applied in real life and the tax court and appeals are backing up IRS audit over these items. Let me go through it. Here's the problem. We have this body of judge-made law where different judges have come in and said this activity does not qualify. The time you spend doing this activity doesn't count towards the material participation testing hours you need to be seen as a real estate professional or in, in a property by property basis materially participating in that property. Auditors are aware of this case law. Matter of fact, if you go read this, if you go read the audit guide I'm telling you to on real estate professionals, it lists all of the activities and the case law came from that said this doesn't count towards that testing. So what activities don't count and will be taken out of the testing? You won't be given credit for this time, even if you can substantiate it. This is the one that really blows my mind, and it seems to be a catch-all they can nail almost anybody on, but here it goes. Time claimed for work that is not customarily performed by the owner of rental real estate, but the owner put in this time doing these tasks that owners don't ordinarily do simply to meet the material participation standards. You put the time in, but you did things that most owners wouldn't do. That's enough to throw that time out. Oh my God. Here's the next squishy concept they can get you on. Time claimed that an investor in real estate would normally put in, okay? If you're investing in real estate, what are the activities that you go through to determine whether an investment in real estate is a good investment to make or not? Whether you're looking at comparables, you're looking at market rents, you're looking at trends, you're looking at numbers, you're looking at financial statements, you're looking at accountings. These types of activities don't count unless you can also show that you're materially participating in the day-to-day -day operations of the property. Some auditors just take this time and toss it, as I'm going to explain in a minute. These are the type of activities that get tossed out of that testing. Again, you come in at 780 hours, all they have to do is parse out 35 hours, and you don't qualify for a real estate professional. In my experience, the following are the activities that auditors try and commonly parse out from the material testing and say that time didn't count to get you below the 750 hours. Time spent studying or reviewing the financial statements of the rental operations, they'll try and parse out. Time spent preparing or analyzing any type of summary of the operations of the property in general will be parsed out. Time spent preparing budgets, making phone calls, Visiting the property, doing a site visit to see if it's operating efficiently will be attempted to be parsed out. Time spent writing checks. Time spent going to the post office. Time spent going to the bank related to your rental activity will be parsed out. Time that you spend preparing Schedule E, which is how you report rental activity profit loss on a tax return, they'll parse it out. Time that you spend organizing your records reading journals, monitoring the finances of operations, anything that they can say you are acting in a non-managerial capacity will be parsed out. It's very interesting to me to note that activities listed above are fully recognizable for material testing purposes where a rental activity rises to the level of a trade or business, but are routinely disallowed and treated as non-countable where the activity is deemed to only rise to the level of investment activity, which is really the, where this is at. You've got that continuum. On this end of the continuum, your involvement in real estate isn't substantial enough to make it trade or business activity. It's investment activity. On this end of the spectrum, your entire life is about rental real estate. All you do involves rental real estate. That's trade or business. Here you're a real estate professional, here you're not. 
on-site management. If you have an on-site manager and an on-site maintenance team, man, that's a kiss of death. All right. How about if you've got a property management company? That can be the kiss of death. All that time put in by others works against you. Let me explain. The IRS routinely takes the position that if a rental activity has an on-site management team, it makes it very, very hard, in their opinion, for a taxpayer to materially participate because rental activities by nature do not require significant day-to-day -day operations or involvement. And therefore, they're not time intensive to begin with. But if you have other people putting in the time necessary to work that activity, how can you materially participate? This is their attitude. The IRS is gonna take the position that because of the on-site management team, the only of the six tests that I went through earlier that you can possibly pass to call it a real estate activity, a deductible real estate activity, a real estate professional real estate activity is the 500 hour test because of the on-site management. And that'll be on a property by property basis. Even if you've made a grouping election, this is how they apply it in real life, even though that's not correct. First thing they're gonna do is look to your other activities and say, is there even 500 hours a year available in your life to provide these activities? Well, let's see. You're a full-time employee. You typically work 400 hours of overtime. Well, that's 2,600 hours approximately of the tax year already gone. Where do you find 500 hours to do this? Auditors are known to equate on-site management with an off-site management investment company. You know, what's important to note here is that property management companies offer services on an a la carte basis. You can have them as involved in that rental property as you want them to be, from doing everything for you to only doing a special part of it. I had a client once where his rental properties were in a bad neighborhood, so he hired a property management company to go in solely to collect the rents. That involvement was enough to call into question whether he actively or materially participated in that property, in that audit. By that example, if the only thing the management company is doing is collecting the rents, that leaves plenty of activities for the owner to do to qualify for material participation. The auditors are specifically trained to look for indications of on-site or off-site management. All they have to look at is who you're cutting checks to. They're getting paid, they're providing some sort of management, that's bad. The auditors are trained to scan the commissions that you deducted, the management fees that you deducted, the expenses for cleaning apartments, for, for maintenance, any type of maintenance that you're paying for, any type of repairs you're paying for, all of that works against you. This is all activity provided by somebody else that you can't claim you did to qualify for the material participation rules. Bottom line is this, each activity, each service that was performed keep that rental activity going that was provided by a third party and not by you works against you. You can't qualify as materially participating if there's a whole bunch of evidence that everything was done by third parties.